I think one of the greatest uh, joys that I, I have in life is being able to talk to people that are much more intelligent than I am. And uh, you fit that. Oh, you can smile. It's okay. You're, you're very, there you go. <laughs> that smile is precious. Um, all right. Absolutely. Have to tell you. Um, I have been waiting to do this with you. Uh, you're, I have a, a book of people that are in a list, uh, a list to, uh, to do these pre-recorded Zooms with, uh, because my audience had, uh, had requested that I spend more time without an audience with my guests. And uh, it was their idea, not mine. And uh, I've been doing them uh, for a bit. And uh, you are at the top of the list of people that oh, I wanted to do this with. And when you said yes, uh, to get together and talk again, and I laid it out for you. Uh, I was tickled pink. I, I, think, know, I'm, right? I think I'm still pink. I I'm still pink. <laughs> <laughs> Eve Bradley has now landed on Narc Abuse TV uh, Zoom Zoom lives, uh, pre-recorded Zooms, and uh, you're going to educate me as your audience of one. But do me a huge favor. I want to know this. Break the Bond program. That's your program, yes? Yeah, that's my group program, yeah. Could you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, so it has kind of organically been created off the back of a program that I have kind of formed on a one-to-one -one basis with the women that I work with. Um, and it's about breaking the trauma bond. So the break your bond is the trauma bond. And the trauma bond is this ever such a strange phenomenon that I don't think anybody ever hears about until they have been in a narcissistic relationship in some way. And often when people do hear about the trauma bond and do start to understand the trauma bond, it makes an awful lot of sense to them. It seems to answer so many questions as to why this thing that they were describing as love didn't look like love, felt like love, but still had this toxic and this intuitive sense of not being the kind of love that we are brought up believing exists between two people. Actually, was in fact this trauma bond and it seems to answer a lot of questions for a lot of people once they understand what it is you, you sound like you just described a porcupine it's kind of like it looks like love but it's gonna hurt it's like yeah. if you try to give it a hug it's gonna hurt it just that popped into my mind as you're describing it eve um uh eve bradley can be found on instagram that's how we met um you did an ig tv live show uh with me it was a hit um i don't think i've ever told you that that's my first time i think letting that out um i haven't heard any feedback yeah, yeah. It, uh, no no it was a hit you were a hit i had to uh i had to leave you up there for a while and then when we started moving the page around and doing some adjustments that we were going to do people were like you know hey where's that 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 one with the lady the the lady you know it's like i have a bunch of ladies which one are you talking about yeah like, there's a few <laughs> eve eve not not adam but eve. yeah i had a bunch of the adam jokes along with that from a few people and uh, they really enjoyed the way you described and talked about a little bit about your life but mainly about narcissism and that's where i want to go right now uh, about narcissism. By the way, uh, just for the record, for those who may see this back later, many of you are accustomed to the way I, I do these uh, these uh, pre-recorded Zoom lives. Eve will be doing a three-part educational series. Uh, this first one will be on narcissism. But if they wanted to find you on Instagram, please let them know. What is your Instagram handle, as it were? Oh, my Instagram handle is a complicated one to say out loud, but I'm going to go for it and everyone listen up close, closely. So it's your dot underscore dot easy dot underscore dot life. Okay. So it's your easy life. And if you put that in the search and in the search bar, you'll find it. Okay. All right. You got all you know, right. Anybody watching this, especially my viewers, my regular viewers, you know who she is. Uh, and you're probably very happy that we're doing one of these because, you know, only certain people get a chance to do these. And uh, I am honored. Now I get to pick your brain. As an audience of one, uh, 
no live audience here with us, narcissism, why it forms. Why does narcissism end up forming in an individual? Yeah, I think there's a few different theories out there, as with all psychology, it's all theory based. Um, but the way that I talk, you know, the research that I've done, the way that I talk about it with the ladies that I mentor, is it's important to recognise that it, it starts very, very young. And it's actually something that's happening right at the beginning of the formation of the limbic system, you know, when our priority as a child is to be fed, is to be dry and safe and warm and loved. And those three things, the safety, the stomach being full and the sense of love are our three main priorities at that time. And at some point um, during that around 18, well, around a, a year to 18 months, maybe a little bit older, something is going on with regards to the relationship with the people that the child is being cared for by in as so much as something is happening where that love is being misconstrued or it's being left out or the needs aren't being met in some way and it skews the impression of attachment and connection with other human beings for that child and it's not all lost at that point if that happens you know I think that's an important thing to recognize is that there are various points as we develop as children into adulthood whereby we can kind of re retread the neural pathways or we can kind of reverse out and start again but if children are not um, experiencing a healthy uh, model of empathy of uh, modesty because we know that grandiosity is a very um, kind of key character trait or personality mm -hmm. trait of the narcissist you know if there isn't a model of modesty then we're going to see grandiosity and if there isn't a model of empathy we're going to see some very selfish self-centered behaviors out of the child and as they develop they're also going to find you'll find that as this child is developing they're trying out like all children different behaviors and then they're getting feedback off those behaviors and if the behaviors that they're displaying get the right feedback if it gets if it serves them in some way and they get the result they're after then actually the morality, whether the behaviour is right or wrong, if that's not being modelled by a parent in a way that is, you know, demonstrating good moral behaviour, fairness, empathy, right. equality, then you're going to find that we've got somebody who's very self-centred, lacks the ability to put themselves into somebody else's shoes and feeds off power and control. And there we have a narcissist. I pretty much could... Could almost stop the recording right here you just you just solved all of mankind's problems thank you so much it's been nice talking <laughs> to you today that's you just oh, i'm just kidding yeah that was that was i talked to a lot of people and uh i love all my guests that was eloquently and like usual because i consider you to be an elegant and classy woman that was amazingly said and done I am just stunned. I want to dissect that. That I could dissect in about 40 minutes. It would take me 40 minutes to break down what I am taking as notes right now. So what you're talking about, let me see if I understand this correctly. I'm going to read this back to you. I'm looking at a situation where someone that is young, it needs to have three main priorities, uh, well, nurtured and taken care of, managed. They need to be fed, they need to be held safe, and they need to, without a doubt, uh, be loved but if these things are not handled properly if their caregivers mismanage this process then the child the young person is not going to get a healthy model yeah. to function from and they're not going to get a good template to work from they're not going to have empathy or they're not going to have modesty as a part of their baseline to work from to work up from. They're gonna become self-absorbed, selfish, a number of other things 
that we see many, well, big body babies walking around in. And they're going to carry that. And that's what we very much, it's very much how, you know, when it comes down to it, we end up describing these people as being big, spoiled kids. Wow. I told you. You know what? Why don't you just why don't we just set up something so you can go talk to the to the United Nations and you can just, <laughs> <laughs> that was there's too many big body kids there. So big, oh, that's the problem. <laughs> there you go. So so essentially you could start this whole you need to start a shirt line, a t-shirt line. This is big body, what would you get? Big body kids, big body babies, yeah. and and hashtag big body babies. You should just do that because some <laughs> Well, realistically, some individuals, male or female, are getting married to people like this. Oh, lots, lots, lots are getting married. It's important to know. I was being modest about that, but you're right, lots. Lots, lots. And in all walks of life, across all socioeconomic statuses, across all races, everywhere this is happening, it is not something that is to one class, to one gen, you know, it's completely across the board. And it is scare, you know, really on the ground, it's happening more than anybody would care to really recognize. Okay, but if the child does what you mentioned, it starts to, well, test out behavior. I mean, pets do that. So absolutely ad- adults you know, are gonna do the children, same children push boundaries it's yes. how we learn it's, yes. you know it's a it's a really healthy way to learn to push boundaries but if parents aren't um themselves modeling positive behavior that is founded on those kind of those core values that love that compassion that empathy that mm-hmm. kindness then the child is going to maybe be successful in pushing boundaries and often children will push bound if if a child is being brought up with those uh, that core values Mm -hmm. at the heart of the parenting a child might well push the boundaries uh, you know one that isn't will push the boundaries of one that is and find that they can manipulate behavior for example to get a result and if they haven't got that sense of putting themselves in the other child's shoes in that moment Mm. they may well find well this works and it could be very innocent childlike behavior you know that like I say they push boundaries but the more it works the more it reinforces the more it makes up their go-to strategies to deal with problems really because we're all out there solving problems all the time that that actually is a part I want to touch on a little bit more if if you could we're talking manipulation right now or, or we deceitful behavior whichever it may be uh, but when it comes to manipulation a child may begin to recognize that their parent is given to being deceitful we're not mm-hmm. just talking lying as a lifestyle pattern or pathological but the child is recognizing that a parent can get in and quote unquote in and out of situations they can take or give manipulation depending on what they want to do what they want to mm-hmm. achieve so the child picks up on that right that's essentially what you're saying definitely children are looking for a model at all times um, a role model uh, modeled behavior is something that we can see and we can see how when a child gets in front of a positive role model how quickly a child can turn a corner can change their behavior and this is like I say this happens right into teenage years and and young adulthood you know often people once they are presented with a positive role model who in some way speaks to them on a level that they can connect with we can see massive changes in people's personality and the development of their personality because ultimately any sort of personality disorder is actually a personality development disorder And at some point, the development is arrested and it stops. And this is why we're talking about these big body babies that are walking (laughs) around is because at some point in their development, everything stopped and they are repeating what went on at that time to stop that development, almost in a sense to try and resolve it. 
you know, as humans, we often will find that we repeat our traumas. Um, we try and recreate uh, anything that's confusing to us, anything that we haven't been able to resolve, we'll often find ourselves recreating the circumstances around it subconsciously more often than not, but we'll find until we can reach a resolution. And I see this with my own toddler. You know, when she's trying to resolve something, she's recreating the situation to try and get to the next stage, to get the feedback and then develop further. And that's exactly what's happening with the personality. And we'll often find absolutely people that haven't got a personality develop, uh, developmental disorder will also repeat things or find themselves in similar situations. I know that I certainly did. I went from one relationship, abusive relationship straight into another because I was trying to resolve whatever it was that was going on there and the emotions that I'd experienced. From the, from the previous situation yeah the next situation in relationship you started to formulate something that could possibly resolve and understand what happened in the first one is what you're saying absolutely because once we start to gather more and more data depending on what kind of person we are as we're starting to experience more when we can draw like we can draw comparisons we can draw differences if we are pragmatic in our approach, if we are able to adopt a perspective where we can come out of our situation and look on it with some sort of, from a different angle, often mm -hmm. we'll find that there's something that needs resolving. Right. That's something a narcissist cannot do. They can't adopt that alternative perspective. And that's why when people ask, can they be helped? Can, they, can this be, you know, cured? Can they develop further actually that's why it's so difficult because you've got to get them to be able to have a level of self-awareness which is very difficult to teach in an adult and the self-awareness has to come into play because they have to recognize the equations that they picked up as a young person to exist and to interact mm. are, are not the optimum equations they're not the uh, it's not Absolutely. the, it's not the best what, formula. Exactly. And what's really interesting to me about, um, about the narcissistic, sociopathic, psychopathic personality types is that they are unable, because of the lack of empathy, because of their inability to put themselves into another person's shoes, they have a model of the world whereby everybody is thinking like them. Because oh, wait, if everybody I'm is I'm sorry, that was time out. That was really good. Hold that thought. They have a model of the world. They're looking at you and I sitting here talking. If we were in all, if we were in a room with one with with a narcissistic uh, person, uh, traits diagnosed or whatever way a person wants to look at it, they're thinking we think like them. Absolutely, because they, they got don't a see a separation. No, they've got a sense of grandiosity, so they already put themselves as though the way that they think operate and are and are is optimum is better than most people and that they can't put up themselves in our situation they can't imagine or adopt kind of a perspective whereby our own experiences so me as a woman would have a different experience to a man yes, yes, who as right, a black yes. man would have a different experience different part of the as world Asian there's man. so much exactly right. they, they won't they be able to do that no, so they all they are doing is modeling in, projecting in their impression of the world into us. And so everything that they believe, we have to believe as well, or we have to adopt those personality traits. So if they're projecting that into well, their world, as it were, mm -hmm. their optimum viewpoint of how everything should go onto us, but I'm just gonna ask, you're the professional in this discussion. So if if that's the case, then Eve, what we're talking about is if it doesn't fit with us, then that means we're the problem in their eyes? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely we're the problem in their eyes. You know, especially, that, you know, that's, cr you know that's crazy, right? <laughs> it is absolutely crazy. It's certifiably crazy. It's, you know, it's sectionably crazy as well if you really go criminal with it. It's, yeah. it's, it is absolutely crazy. That, that means that when an individual decides to marry someone like that, 
let alone with all due respect to, to others, God forbid, have a child with them. Mm -hmm. They're opening up, they're opening up a door to have their mind brainwashed or go complete be tortured. It's like absolutely. one or the other. And because you either disappear or you give in. Absolutely. And even the giving in, to some extent, you can never give in enough. And so oh, you can never give never enough. enough. Wow. So you, whilst you could commit a lot and you know there are plenty of people out there that do commit their life to feeding this monster essentially and feeding the supply and they do sadly you know the relationship ends when they die and that is a very very sad just a sad fact that you know me as a, someone who works in this field and campaigns in this field wants to ensure that children are being educated about healthy relationships so that's not happening but the reality is generationally if we look back then absolutely there are lots of people that have never made it out of these relationships and, and they they in essence uh, were watched by their children or others family members recognizing that they're disappearing essentially who they Absolutely, were. and that is and, and the, that is the result: the loss of the identity, the loss of self, the loss of self worth. You know, that is the result of somebody feeding off all of your great good traits, really. And you know, it does sort of bring us back to this trauma bond thing: is that often we can they rationalise this um, relationship by defining what they are experiencing as love, and they almost change their definition of love to wow. fit the trauma bond and really when we talk about why the narcissist forms why the trauma bond forms it's because that's what the narcissist experienced when we go right back to that lack of you know at some point the needs not being met mm -hmm. what was happening there was a trauma bond because it wasn't kind compassionate understanding forgiving love it was in some way based on control or on an inability to get what they needed and therefore they will externalize their experience and they'll wrap that up as love because the truth is too painful the truth that your main caregiver hates you is too painful to actually process especially at such a young age so is that a is that a constant lifestyle of running away from that truth in order mm -hmm. to maintain the trauma bond with with as many people, if not everyone that they meet so that their world does not come crashing down that what they have Absolutely. Is, is, ab is actually dysfunctional as it were, is actually not healthy. In other words, let's just say that. Absolutely. And you know, it's that sense of false reality that you will can then see play out in the materialistic nature of the narcissist okay. in that obsession about how things look to the outside world Absolutely. and that's where you might see more um over narcissists that aren't necessarily um malignant in the way that they operate in their lives so mm. there are a lot of narcissists that aren't what we'd consider to be abusive because actually they are not abusive because the shame of being labeled an abuser would then not Agreed. fit with the sense of grandiosity. Right. So that right. almost prevents them from being abusive. However, we have got a lot of malignant and covert narcissists whereby the damage is being done inside the relationship. Yeah. The havoc is being caused in other individuals' yeah. lives. That alone is abusive in itself, uh, yeah. even if they don't want that label. Because to be labeled an abuser then that would start to put the spotlight on their behavior and upbringing and their inability they to have to self-reflect yeah they, they have, have to self-reflect self yeah. and it isn't possible yeah it just isn't possible for them to be able to look inwards it's better it's better to label you and i if they walk into a room as abusive toward them and well i guess it Absolutely. Too, if a person if they have children or a person is around them or is a, is a person is their their mate uh, their marriage mate or, or their partner uh, in doing business or anything, we can start to have them rub off on us. And Definitely. we'll start looking at everyone else in a paranoid type of a way or projecting onto them whatever Absolutely. we picked up from them, from the narcissist. 
and you know part of that is almost a survival mechanism because yes. I know yeah. from my own personal experience the kind of rationale or the way that you approach it is well if you're going to behave like that and it gets the result that you want because I know yeah, that I'm yeah, complying yeah. on yeah. the basis of your behavior because I can feel myself doing it yeah. well I'm going to try and see if you comply mm-hmm. on the basis of my behavior and when they don't that's often when the alarm bells might start to um go off and the realization starts to happen but often that is once we have reacted back in some way and for some people you know if the campaign of fear is so vehement and so present and the physical and emotional threat is one that is just so so threatening Mm -hmm. then maybe we will never react back because the fear of of what could happen next is too much and that's completely understandable you are working to make sure, Eve, you are working to make sure that your uh, your child, I'm sorry, you have one or two children. Uh, two kids, two okay. girls. I've got I'm, two kids. I don't, want, I don't want one of them to hear it and go like, hey, which one was he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have children, with all due respect to them, uh, not to leave anybody out, because I have children, I know how they will, will react to that. So don't leave them, <laughs> out, don't leave them out, trust me. Uh, and their mind are grown. But what I was going to mention is when it comes to your children, you're making sure to lay down these, well, these health, these healthy stepping stones for them Absolutely. to walk on, um, irregardless of, of what uh, you, you, you personally have experienced. But what was it like for you, if you could describe a little bit, when you were in a relationship with someone who was essentially going to, well, coerce you to live mm-hmm. off, of, off of a trauma bond, not off of a loving bond, the bond of love, but off of a trauma bond. They wanted to make sure you lived off of that with them. When you were in that, when did it become clear to you? What event, what set of circumstances did it become clear to you? This is not working. Yeah, absolutely. There were a set of circumstances. There wasn't one particular event that made me realise that he had these traits. There was a particular event that made me escape, and that did happen one day. But actually, the build-up to understanding what was going on in the relationship, I think, for so like so many people, it was a culmination of factors, behaviours, information that came in you know some of it I think everybody I speak to often will say that they don't really know how they found out about narcissism but it just sort of happened one it's day just, just somebody of, mentioned uh, it they came across it on for me I came across it on a blog post and yeah. I was just you know was drawn to find out more okay. all right the um for a long time in our relationship I thought I was the problem. I'd come out of an abusive relationship. I had um, been in a business where I was very busy. I had given over a lot of my time and energy to the business. It was a hospitality business. So it was very long hours. It was very intensive. Mm -hmm. And this man swooped in and he was going, he, you know, he played the role as my knight in shining army. He would protect me. He would never treat me like my husband. He would support me, you know, he would, and he would, and I was exhausted physically Mm. working and he was being that kind of comforting and caregiving role that I needed at the time. And that's when the trauma bond was forming because that's what, I needed him to be and he was that's what he was being Mm -hmm. the fact that wasn't his real personality that it wasn't his real yeah who he was yeah 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 only comes apparent later on by that time you know uh, my mental health is kind of blamed my um my previous relationship is blamed so any sort of reaction or response to his behavior me thinking it wasn't healthy that we weren't communicating he right, wasn't, right, right. wasn't expressing nothing was ever good enough you know any of that all went back to well this is because you were abused in your marriage and it took a long time for me to then start to think well actually I did a lot of work on healing myself in the relationship when it came to those sorts of with came to the previous relationship and 
it was only once I started to do that and his behavior didn't change. The promises were made, nothing was kept. It became very apparent how cyclical the behavior was, even to the point where I took responsibility for the cycle at one point because it was blamed that it was tied in with my menstrual cycle. Wait, wait, wait. I, you took blame for the cycle of his moodiness, essentially, and technically his abusive behavior. Absolutely, because Co he projected coercive. so much of it onto me. And, and, you were, would then... uh, and you're trying to grow and make sense of everything and, and mm -hmm. well, build, build a relationship, build a family, build a legacy yeah, as, as a couple together. And he used that against you. I'm sorry. I find that interesting, that part, because it actually is a common thing for women to experience that. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Taking the blame and then in turn having someone tell them, of course, previous relationship and a number of other things, but tell them that other aspect and tie it to them physically. Definitely. It's very, very common. I, yeah, you're actually, yeah. You're actually Absolutely. the first guest that I'm actually getting a chance to talk about. I, I plan on doing a show about it at some point, but I find it because I've heard it quite often. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how easily if a woman is not careful that that abuser is mm -hmm. using that to keep her in, as Absolutely. It were, and because a, sla of the, a slave state, a slave state. Go ahead. Exactly that. And because I suppose the menstrual cycle ties in, you know, in terms of even the time span, you know, it's a week long where the PMS stuff is yeah. happening. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, it just sort of feeds or it suits the narrative there it to is. them. It suits and, the narrative. You know, yeah. The reality is that as we were describing earlier, because they externalize all of the fault of the world being with, with everybody else in the world and none of it being with them. Yeah. They react, they prop they will believe that that is what the problem is. Well, because the reality to them, no matter what you would say, let exactly. alone a, let alone a relationship expert or a scientist could say, it doesn't matter. It's because of what she has gone through. Did he attack your family in the process too? I'm just curious to ask. Um, do you know, there was an incident. We actually had to live with my parents for a little while. We moved to Spain for nearly a year in, in the relationship. And when we came back, we couldn't tie up getting, you know, accommodation straight yeah. off yeah. the back. So we okay. stayed at my parents for a while. And the tension that he created around my interactions with the, my family you know yeah. if I, anything that I spoke about was inappropriate I shouldn't have said it I shouldn't have said it like that I shouldn't have you know it's none of their business um and you know obviously things that anyone would talk about with their family nothing of any sort of either you're you just, would even think you're being human yeah you would even exactly. think it's just family we're just talking and again, it's interesting because if you think back to the way that their relationship with family formed, well, though, they wouldn't have those conversations uh, with family yeah. because, especially if they're the scapegoat member of the, you know, the way that the narcissistic family is created or is, is quite interesting in itself. But, you know, there are a couple of roles that happen within a narcissistic family dynamic and there's a scapegoat often and a golden child. And he was definitely the scapegoat character. So to him, having a healthy connection with your parents was something that was just so alien. So for me to talk about our day, our business, you know, our you yeah. know, normal yeah. goings on, right. the kids, you know, how, how what was going on with my eldest at the time, my youngest wasn't around, but you know that would have was all re kind of re-wrapped up to be problematic despite the fact that I know now and anybody looking on would know that they it's were not a problem run of the mill yeah. conversations yeah and, and it was important for him just I'm asking your opinion was it important let me rephrase that was it important from your perspective now looking back I'm just curious that he needed to cause havoc he needed to as you said tensions were created did it seem like that was his intent wherever Absolutely, he went to create tension even if he was going out to eat uh, oh my goodness and going out to eat was one of the most uh 
always wow. whenever we went out to eat he always found a problem and I just mentioned that I was in hospitality when we met and so yeah, I yeah. lived and ran a restaurant right. and he actually even and I didn't pick up on it at the time I you know was very much in the love bombing stage but at one point he complained to me about the meal that was served in my restaurant that he was eating <laughs> for, free. for free I was gonna say you beat me to it I had a feeling you were gonna say that for free and, and he, he had, had, he had me go and speak to the chef and explain what had been wrong on the meal and then me report back with the resolution oh wow <laughs> sorry that's i'm sorry i go back to that it's really you know, crazy we that's as crazy. humans often put you know we try we often repress memories and i repressed that one until i was way out of the woods and healthy and okay. healed but that isn't it just crazy yeah, that had to like pop up and you went like, wait a minute, <laughs> memory came up. Definitely. And, and so Definitely. a person who uh, is in this situation should should not beat themselves up if these memories start popping up, because that Definitely. means that means your brain is 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 purging. It's ready. It's, it's, it's ready, ready to, to it's ready. It's ready to, yes, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's definitely purging and processing it because it's ready for a new happy memory because it's kicking Absolutely. the other one out. It's kicking that one out going, like, by the way, remember that? Don't get in that situation again. I love that, that it's ready for that new happy memory to come in because so many women that I work with, and I do work with women, I'm sure men that do experience the same, the same. but for me, I can only report on what I, what I know, what I yeah, work right, on. Right, right. But, you know, for so many women that I work with, they are so fearful when these memories come in. They are so kind of concerned oh, or it, it raises okay. alarm, you know, when they have those memories because they feel like they're never going to escape them. And often okay. the sign of a trauma bond is, you know, having these obsessive thoughts. But actually, when the, the subconscious will not present something to you that it doesn't believe that you have the tools to resolve and I find that to be a really comforting thing because I know that when these things come up or have come up that somewhere in me there's a belief that I can resolve this and the more that you do resolve the more that you do you know allow yourself to experience those memories those emotions in a safe space and in a safe way then like you say you open up space for the positive, the good, for the wisdom to start to come out of these experiences. And, and that's not always easy to do because it seems like the pain is, is reoccurring and lingers on. Yeah. But in actuality, uh, it, it, well, it's kind of like we've got a big emotional toothbrush that's brushing our brain. Uh, and it's it's getting into the crevices, it's, getting, it's making sure that we don't have emotional cavities uh, with these and people. you know what I said at the beginning about oh, us repeating the traumas yes. mm -hmm. often right. our right. body can yeah. and our brain trying to present us with them because it wants us to resolve them so actually if we are able to dedicate some energy towards healing in whatever way that is for for you then you will find that you can resolve it and then you can move into the next phase, into the next phases of healing, the next phases of growth and development. Yeah. And, and, not, and not be afraid of where it's taking you. I think curiosity around right. these things and why, you know, I, for me, my personal, I find I'm curious. I'm curious yeah. as to why these things come up when they do. I'm curious yeah. as to what, when I resolve it, what's going to come in next. And that was a big mindset shift for me that happened that made me not fear healing and resolving this stuff, but having that belief that I can, that I have all the tools that I need. And you're no different than if I have a massive physical trauma, God forbid, that wouldn't happen, right. but I, I would know that my body has everything it needs to heal it i don't worry about a scab forming when i cut my arm yeah and that's the same thing with emotional healing is because the thoughts are so painful and because we often feel like we are our thoughts we find it difficult to trust that actually the thoughts can come in they can move away they can come back again they can go yeah. again yeah. and you know we can we can resolve them and we can we can learn from them we can convert them into wisdom and mm -hmm. learn more about ourselves and that scab will turn into a scar yeah, yeah. you 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 uh 
you highlighted a number of things well, and you took a word I was just about to use, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say it, that scab, you mentioned the scab. We can develop these emotional scabs. It's okay, you're forming a new skin, and you'll never go down that road again because you'll remember, okay. even if it sets a scar, you still have protective skin. So I, I'm, I love what you have just said and what you just described, but I'm gonna ask you this. I, I'm looking at uh, some notes that I have here, and I'm gonna ask you this. Narcissism, just what does it create in the relationship that a narcissist has? In a relationship that a narcissist has with another person, what does this behavior create in that relationship? It's obvious the trauma bond and the narcissist working together, because essentially mm. they work together. He, yeah. the, the narcissist makes sure the trauma bond stays alive. That's, yeah, that's, their, that's their ultimate goal. Uh, mm -hmm. That's his superpower is to be manipulative and, and coercive and a number of other things to keep it alive. Yeah. But what does that really do to the relationship itself? It feeds their ego. It feeds the narrative that they've got about their life and what goes to make them worthy, I suppose, of being alive, because we all need to feel worthy of being alive in order mm -hmm. to actually keep ourselves alive, to keep putting the food yeah. in our mouth, Sen to keep sense of purpose. Water. Yeah, the yeah we've purpose, got right. to have something that's driving. And, you know, that's why ego gets such a bad rap. You know, when somebody's got an ego, yeah. it's a negative yeah. thing. Yeah. But actually, we need an ego yeah. because without yeah. it, we just walk off the cliff with the lemmings, well, you know? Well, many of us if we're not careful without an ego, we won't do anything to take care of ourselves. And absolutely, that, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a that's problem. Absolutely right. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, that, there's it, a definite, you know, without an ego, we become nihilistic. Yeah. We wonder what it's all for. Yeah. And then we might well yeah. just yeah. wander we'd be, off. We'd be buying sheets all the time instead of actually washing them. So, but yeah. so it ego however, means, that doesn't mean that we can't um, transcend the ego, that we can't come out of the ego. We can't you know, adopt it. an ego when right. we need it and not yeah. when we don't. Now, you know, that's a healthy way to operate with an ego. Yeah. So we, we doesn't do that. <laughs> we can we we can have certain things that we pull out of our out of our refrigerator to to function. You know, ego. We may be sad sometimes, angry. We may have mm -hmm. a number of things, but you're essentially laying out that a narcissist likes to stay in a certain lifestyle. Absolutely. You if know, you had to describe that lifestyle for somebody who maybe is beginning this journey, and is just googled narcissism. What kind of lifestyle, how would you describe, maybe in a few words, two or three words, how would you describe a narcissistic person's personality, excuse me, lifestyle? How would you describe their lifestyle? In pursuit of supply, I think. Would, That's it, right? Just, they just in need. In pursuit of supply, they are fueled by. 24 seven. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. And it doesn't matter if you give them admiration, adoration, oh. idolization, or if you give them hatred, anger. They take it all. They'll have it. Whatever it is that you've got to give them that day, they will take it. And sometimes they like to take, they like to manipulate, well, a lot of the time they like to manipulate the situation to see which one they can get. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's a good one. Oh, wait a minute. So... It's kind of like, what is that? That's like walking into a store going like, do I want that today or do I want that today? Are you trying to, that mindset is kind exactly, of like that? Exactly, exactly, yeah. Again, and you know, I repeat, that's pretty And that's I suppose, I think that people would be able to say that they recognize that feeling of not knowing what's coming that day, the walking on eggshells. And that's because the same event can create a Different positive response. experience. Oh. And that event could create a negative one. So let's take the restaurant as a perfect exam example. Not every single time at the beginning of the relationship, when we went to a restaurant, did he want to complain to the manager? But at the beginning, at the, at beginning. the end, at the he end. did because that became a great way for him to get the supply. Because not only could he get the supply from the uncomfortable experience that I was having, I also would then deal with the complaint because I've got experience in hospitality. I wouldn't dare let him go. And the poor people that worked there, I would much prefer it to come from me. I would speak to the right person, say it in the right way. 
and try and, you know, play it down and get the discount on the bill, which was the ultimate aim for him because money is power and control to these people. So wow. any discount he can essentially absorb as being his own one-upmanship over the situation. Wow. And that's how all the the latter restaurant experiences went to the point where I would then not go out to the restaurant. But that, again, would present another experience, you know, another opportunity for him to start questioning why I wouldn't want to go out to a restaurant with him because why wouldn't you want to go out knowing inevitably that you were going to have to make some poor 16-year-old waitresses shift unbearable for the rest of the evening? Literally, that could be an ongoing thing that would be stuck with you because at some point, if you didn't, he was going to discard you anyhow Absolutely. And that was, it was, it's almost as if they create these, this havoc and uh, they create this tension in a person's life, knowing that they're going to leave so that that person, every time they go to that restaurant, they'll be thinking about them and the bad experience. Absolutely. That, that's just me. That's just me looking at it that way. It's, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. There is a level of that because, you know, if you can corrupt somebody's experience yes, or behavior, yes. then ultimately yes. we're all going to have to live with the fallout of that corruption. Yes. You know, you're absolutely right. Fortunately, you know, in the past 18 months, I'll say we haven't been able to go out to many restaurants. A lot have been closed. That's worked out pretty you're good. You're absolutely <laughs> right. You know, something that I love to do, which was eat out. I was in hospitality, you know, like I say, it's something I really enjoy doing. He attacked what you loved corrupted because he would constantly make it uncomfortable oh so uncomfortable so so did you did you start to become a really great cook and chef at home because you didn't want to go out anymore do you know <laughs> or, the irony was, was takeout was takeout are we ready for the most, the most ironic thing about it i wasn't allowed to cook i made one meal for him um, very early on in our relationship, it was a like a sausage casserole. I don't know if you do you have casserole. Oh, don't worry about it. You're going to ship it to me. Just ship it from the UK. Oh, Just well, you don't want it apparently. <laughs> I can't do it. But anyway, I put some beans in it and I should never have put beans in it. And I never lift it down. And that's another interesting thing. You know, once wow. there's been an event that they have been able to demean or just, you know, humiliate yep. you over, then every time a sausage is mentioned, so is there's the that event casserole. there's that event again exactly no matter what and, and that uh, just completely floored my confidence around cooking and you know as I could say I was in the restaurant I was in the kitchen fully trained to work in a kitchen serve hundreds of people a day you know cook 100 meals a day and when I came out of the relationship actually getting back in the kitchen and regaining my confidence around cooking was something that I really took on as I'm going to do this. You know, that was one of my challenges. You know, when I talk about how I um, work with people to break the trauma bond, one of the important things to do is to divert your attention and your focus back onto yourself so that your subconscious is able right. to recognize that you are number one again. And that isn't in a selfish way, that's in a fill up your cup because everything is easier and everything is much more positive for those around you and those that you love if your cup is full. And cooking is one of those things that is a really, really great activity because it's step by step. It means that you have to remain present. You're using lots of different senses. You are working towards an end goal because you might be following a recipe or you might have an idea of what it looks like. Your um, senses are stimulated through scent, through the colours, through the feel and the, and the difference. So, you know, actually utilising that activity with the intention to heal is really, really powerful. And it's that kind of thing that really goes up to make my strategy to break the trauma bond right. because these are things that you can also incorporate into your daily lives because let's face it most people that I work with they're single moms they're busy you know they can't sit down and meditate for an hour and a half a day and you know it's about getting some activities getting some actions that they can take with really really strong intention and they just work because by the end of it they will find 
I found, you know, chopping is a great way to break the trauma bond, because if you're thinking about breaking a trauma bond whilst you're chopping up a carrot, that knife is slicing, it's doing the action that your subconscious can translate into your desire to break that bond and, and to, to regain the power. Okay, that was really, really good. So we've got, uh, we've got cooking. Let's just take that for example. Cooking is something that uh, some may do well, some may not do well, some may, if they, they did a little bit more, they will do it well, whatever the case may be. But it's an, it's an aspect that somebody can get into, an act that they can do that will help them to translate into, well, they're being present in the moment. Mm -hmm. They can kind of relate to chopping things up that they're mm -hmm. literally chopping off that trauma bond and they're, they're making a new dish in life as it were, they're moving forward. Exactly. They There's don't so have to feel it. trapped. In other words, based upon what you said, a person doesn't have to feel trapped. There are no. things that they can do with their hands and their brain. And it may not be a marathon, but that may work for somebody too. But there are mm. things that they can do is what you're saying. So they focus more on themselves instead of focusing on what happened to them. Because something Absolutely. did happen to them. And when doing that, often that's when the brain, when you know, when you get into that state, when the brain is able to focus, you know, it is like a zen-like kind of um but a mentality almost, you know, the East yeah. would say that this kind of thing is about doing yeah. things in a kind of Zen way with purpose, methodically. Purpose. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas in the Western world, we call it behavioral activation yeah. therapy, which is following steps. Yeah. You know, it's this, it's resulting a in recipe, the same. Like a recipe. You know, yeah. Exactly. Recipe. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So with that, with that mindset in place, a person can start to feel that they're growing, they're learning, they, they play, they grow, they're starting to, to, to move about life in a different way, in a much better way, probably the way they were doing before they ever met the narcissist. Absolutely. Although certainly the way that when they were with the narcissist, they wished it was, you yeah, know, even they if were. they never actually had experienced it before, yeah. there's certainly that sense, that draw, that things should be different than they yeah. are. And you can start to play out exactly that, the ways in which it could be different. And when you do that, when you kind of, when you... Um, kind of keep utilize the mind with that presence with that doing something kind of um those actions what happens is the space below happens you know that you can start to resolve things and it's that resolution and often people will always say you know especially when they're doing these actions you know if it's cooking if it's gardening with intention right. if it's crafting with intention if it's exercising with intention at the end of it, they've had at least one aha moment or they've resolved something. You know, something's happened where they've thought they've released in some way. And that's what I find that once you match intention with action, you get these releases. And with those releases, a person starts to become more and more curious about life. They start to feel alive again especially uh, again you were growing with, confidence in your ability yeah. you know, like for me personally I was told I couldn't cook for four years you know every time that I did try to do anything and you know we know how it works the self-fulfilling prophecy is a very real thing when I'm being told I can't cook of and, course I end up yeah. burning it yeah no it's in in again I was going to highlight did you work with women and I really want to hone in on this aspect as a, as a father of two daughters, this aspect of, well, you were told or you lost your curiosity based upon some of my notes we were just taking. Mm -hmm. That is a fundamental, that is a, yeah, well, curiosity leads to creativity. As Absolutely. You, as you, so I'm glad you mentioned that, but this is fundamentally who a woman is. A it's woman is, so is curious. You know, yeah. it's, it's like, how could you not tell her to be curious? Well, that curiosity is not going to work when you're living with or dealing with a manipulator and a liar. Exactly. Okay. It doesn't you can, serve. You know, the last thing you need you to do is be curious. You need you to exactly. just stay in one place Absolutely. and don't move so I can keep doing whatever dirt I'm doing. But Absolutely. A, a curious woman is a creative woman. And, those and she's a dangerous woman oh, because yeah, like we that. begin to. That's right. That's right. 
Begin Certainly the to the narcissist. Well, we begin to, like you say, we start to come at things from different angles. We start yeah, to find new right. solutions to the same oh, problems. Yeah, and right. it doesn't serve them for us to be finding solutions to the problems. It serves we, them to keep spinning us up in the, in the same yeah. problem. Yeah, which, which pretty much explains what a, what a woman can keep in mind when she's dealing with a narcissist that's in her life. He doesn't want you to build and solve and help and maintain and manage and grow and mm -mm. and give a different angle on something he no wants you to only see he one angle you, he does no oh, matter yeah, how whatever. much he it's tells you he He's wants lying. you to yeah. he's just <laughs> right. lying and yeah, he, because they will never attain the standard that he sets out yeah. or, and, or she well that's true never attain it. But you, he or she but essentially as in this case we're talking about men uh, a, a male narcissist he no matter what standard he sets up you'll you never know, attain it because you go from not cooking when you were interested in doing those things before you met him to being in a restaurant and now having to solve problems that he created in a restaurant mm -hmm. in public. So was there a point where who he was in private and who he was in public started to both come out and he, it was the same? Because at the beginning, who he was in private, he never really showed you because he gave you this pu public persona in which he was this nice person. Mm. But did you start to along the way recognize it's like he just, as it were, was the expression, took the mask off and he was just mean all the time? No, he wasn't mean all the time. I think that, you know, that's why we find ourselves in those that having so many questions about whether what we are experiencing is, is, is as bad as it yeah. as we think it mm -hmm. is, is it's real, you know, they're very good at keeping us on the on the edge almost of, of what we can what we can take and what we can't. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were occasions where he would be particularly cruel to people out and about, especially when it comes to money. He was very miserly about money. And so, you know, if he felt like somebody was trying to get money off him or, you know, yeah. overcharge or yeah. something wasn't worth what he deemed it to be, what value he deemed it to have, but was different to the one that they had set to it then he would have he would definitely turn into that yeah. really M that money, he was money a bully. monster you know, a he money was a bully. monster he was absolutely a bully. and he was a bully and he would bully people if he felt like they were in some way trying to screw him over financially and it was often money you know it wouldn't be anything else and you know that's a very strong characteristic of a narcissistic personality traits or personality disorder is this focus on money and material oh. that we just can't get our heads around but also we don't we don't want to challenge because it's just money you know if you've got oh, the kind of approach to money okay. where you think it's just yeah. money it doesn't matter then when you have to if you try to kind of defend it or stand up to it or have conversations about it you've got to adopt that mindset whereby it's important and I don't think it's that yeah. important so I wow. can't pretend to make it important enough to then challenge that behavior and that just fuels it and feeds it okay so you pretty much kind of give me something I've never thought of with that statement because I've heard others say that on my show on Instagram is that they also view it the same way you just said about money. It's it, it's almost, do they look for people? They kind of view money like that? They're, I think they're, so. They're, I gener think they're generous and it's not, they're not going to fight you over. Generosity, absolutely. Yeah. I think generosity, you know, I, uh, the women that I meet, they, you know, there are shared characteristics that I okay. can identify. And, okay. you know, that kindness, that compassion, generosity, forgiveness, you know, being a forgiving and understanding person. And the interesting thing to me, the ironic thing, the thing that often unlocks the healing is those are all the things that you need to show yourself to heal. Everything <laughs> that you give over oh, to them wow. in the relationship are all the things that you need to wow. reflect onto yourself in order to heal. Wow. Okay, so if we made a list of shared, shared characteristics, they may end up 
proving to be almost like the template that we Absolutely. need to focus on while we're cooking or doing anything else. Or, exactly. Or dancing, That's exactly or dancing right. so that we can literally move ourselves away from this abusive person. And uh, just start practicing. And recover, and recover. Go ahead. Absolutely. Go ahead. And get into that recovery. And, and just start practicing what it feels like. You know, it can be so, we can so easily forgive their behaviors in the relationship, not necessarily outside. Once we're, once we're aware of what's going on, it's, it's, it's not necessary to forgive. You know, I wouldn't encourage anyone to waste too much energy on trying to forgive somebody that's been quite so cruel. But the reality is inside the relationship whereby we have forgiven their behaviour, despite our intuition telling us, despite us knowing that it's unacceptable behaviour in a relationship, that those moments of forgiveness, they're the ones that if we just turn them around, show ourselves that forgiveness in that moment unlock that that relationship with ourselves whereby we can start to reconnect with our with our identity and when we start to reconnect then there's there's less or little or no room for resentment and uh, other things exactly. that can can cause us to be quote unquote triggered or uh, negatively stimulated by them if we have to see them or anything like that because we exactly. recognize exactly who we're dealing with what we what do we say at the beginning the big babies well how do we call it what do the you say? big body big, baby big body yeah big, big, i'm telling it's you it's getting you need, a hashtag you need to start you need to i'm telling you you need to do it you know we're gonna have to when, when we're done with this we're gonna have a little private talk i got some other things i'll throw your way you know i'm gonna be looking for it go like okay because you know we we do we do this type of show nobody will, you you get the hashtag out before anybody can get it we do a live show <laughs> no i've done it with people i've done a live show and told them hey you should do this and next thing i know i go like didn't i tell so-and-so to do a t-shirt now see this person doing it so it's like i don't even i don't even like doing it in the live shows anymore it's like they still your still the idea you should have uh anyhow what i was going to mention to you is this before we have to end um one of the main reasons why we were looking at uh doing this is to emphasize uh that you and i are on the same page of focusing on recovery, more mm -hmm. so than focusing on uh, per se definitions and uh, the, the other aspects. Uh, so when we get together again, we're gonna look at uh, relationships uh, and how it forms, how these uh, form with a narcissist, uh, how it shows up, uh, how it affects day-to-day -day life and future relationships in our second uh, of a three-part series, educational series, on uh, the second part will be on relationships. This first part on narcissism was to give an overview, if not uh, aspects uh, that uh, maybe others can connect with because you told a little bit about uh, yourself. But if you had to say, and someone, again, I'm speaking mainly to the majority of my audience or people who are in the beginning of their journey and it's not looking good to them. They don't see a recovery. They don't see a recovery because they look at everything they're about to lose if they uh, divorce yeah. them uh, or, or whatever the case may be. Your words of wisdom and encouragement to them that recovery is possible, especially with Absolutely. your especially with your break the bond program. Absolutely. I think, you know, focus. The, the initial step is to break that trauma bond. And breaking that trauma bond, we spoke about opening up space for positive memories, you know, for, for good things to happen. But the trauma bond takes up so much energetic, emotional, physical space for us. And, you know, like you say, when we talk about relationships and how the trauma bond forms, we'll talk in detail about those three aspects of the trauma bond, the energetic, the emotional and the physical mm -hmm. aspects. And once that's been broken, we have got an awful lot of space. We've got an awful lot of energy. And we've also got this, this sense of ourself that we can fill with the space that breaking the trauma bond creates when it comes to the amount of space that we have to feel and accept the good things uh, the birth mm -hmm. of a child uh, becoming an uncle or an aunt and or uh, um, getting a new puppy uh, having plants that uh, we may take care of a garden we may take care of there's a lot of emotional things that are positive that could happen and the space for that in us is unlimited it but, absolutely it is but when it's filled when the trauma yeah. bond is there and it's gripped and we are you know being tugged at by this trauma bond 
it's trying to draw us with those thoughts, with those, with those constant thoughts yeah. about either what they're doing, what they're thinking, why they did something, why they behave like that, whether you know you're ever going to feel be able to go into a relationship again whereby it's going to be you know where you feel like you can trust somebody else Mm -hmm. all those kinds of thoughts they're all wrapped up in being very much under the kind of hold of the trauma bond and that way you know waking up in the morning thinking about them going to sleep at night thinking about them that is an awful lot of energy that is being directed towards the relationship the trauma bond whether you're with them or not yeah, whether they're in the room or not, it's mm-hmm. it's being attacked. That space is being well, that space is being crammed uh, into with a bunch of negative stuff and bad memories of dealing with. And them. we'll so, talk in the next in the next installment yeah. about why that is actually serving us at the time awesome. and why it becomes difficult to do that because of some of the the um, the subconscious goings on that are happening wow. at that time. Okay. All right. Well, now that you, uh, you've wet my appetite for more, um, there is something that individuals can do maybe to start to connect with you and your program, anything offhand, or what do they need to do to get more information about Break the Bond, your program? You can visit my website for more information about Break the Bond um, program. There's also a webinar on my website, completely free to watch webinar, instant watch, um, which talks about how the trauma bond forms and then starts to um, explain how we can formulate a strategy to break the bond. And that's the initial kind of background information that helps to understand why the Break the Bond programme is going to work for you because it brings in everything that you need in a 12-week period as well as the connection and the support of others that are going through this same experience as you right now. For and that's any, really, really key. For anyone that needs some assistance, you have just experienced Eve Bradley. Um, she's a one-of-a-kind person. Uh, who has truly made an impact on my uh, IGTV channel. And I am honored that that you're uh, in the library of shows that that we have. But what we got a chance to do today, uh, I knew it was going to be like this. This was so awesome with you today. Seriously, I really mean this. I've learned so much. I got my notes over here. You know, (laughs) I I was going like, do I have I have two sheets just in case. I got one full and I got, and I said, am I going to be able to cram it in? And I want you to know there were tons of notes I should have been taking, but I was just too enthralled to sit here and try to go uh, toe to toe and understand what you were saying and not miss a point. And you have educated me again, madam, and I truly appreciate it. I humbly say uh, this to everyone and not trying to boast, but you need to connect uh, with Eve. Uh, so when you watch this back, feel free to do so. The program is uh, the Break the Bond program, the trauma bond is a disgusting uh, tool that is used uh, by a narcissistic individual, a self-absorbed person to uh, take up space, uh, as Eve has taught us today, to take up space emotionally in your life for all the good stuff, being curious, being happy, uh, everything from cuddling uh, to to growing plants, uh, everything that you Mm -hmm. would think is good uh, is consumed by one person trying to get you to figure them out um don't waste and your if, time with that you don't know waste the, your time the with irony that, is the bond yeah. it just acts as that drain it's that drain the supply we talked wow. about the being in pursuit of supply and it's where yeah. they can get their supply from right so don't fall for it everybody please mm-hmm. uh talk with eve eve thank you so much for doing this um look forward to number two and uh, mm-hmm. you know what? I, I think it's time for you to make, uh, you know, your special guest appearance on IGTV again. And uh, we'll talk about what that'll be about. Because uh, everybody uh, misses you. So you're going to have to come back. They don't even want to talk to me anymore until you come back. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, have to, we'll have to work that out. But anyhow, thank you very much. We'll see you later. Thank you for doing this. We'll talk you're again. You're welcome. Right? See you soon. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye. I appreciate it. And uh, at this point, I do want to ask you this one more time. Tell everybody one more time how they can find you your Instagram page. One more My time. Insta- Instagram page is at your dot underscore dot easy dot underscore dot life. 
I'd rather you say it than me. All right. We'll see you later. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>